welcome back to our group reading of Star Wars Aftermath. This is our third week of uh, reading this wonderful, wonderful book. Today we are going to talk about Chapter 3, as well as the second interlude, uh, which is the interlude on Chandrilla. If you're not familiar with the series, click on the link and it will take you to the playlist of, of this kind of book club. Uh, and if, if you just want to watch instead of reading along, that's totally fine too. I'm always interested in what any of you have to say. But with that, let's dive into the story. So chapter three uh, is where we meet probably, I would say my second favorite character out of the Aftermath series. We haven't gotten to my favorite character yet, and that is the character of Singer. Singer, Wrath, Wraith, Singer. We get to Singer. Singer is hilarious. He's sarcastic. He's dry in humor, but drunk in demeanor. Uh, I, I love everything about this character. But he also has a very interesting perspective in this series because he is a former Imperial. So here's where we kind of learn a little bit more about what the Empire is actually doing in, in Aftermath. So he explains how he was a, uh, basically he was a loyalty officer. So his job in the Empire wasn't necessarily to hunt rebels. He was to hunt potential rebels within the Imperial ranks. He made sure people who were in the Empire wanted to be in the Empire. And it creates this really great theme of guilt and redemption uh, in a detailed way that we don't see a lot in Star Wars, uh, but also on a very small scale sort of way. And I don't mean small scale as an insult. So um, one of the great stories out of Legends is, of course, Mara Jade. And Mara Jade has a very long redemption arc. She's one of the few people to kind of return from the dark side and get to live to tell the tale and deal with, you know, all the things she had done. Uh, Sinjur is very similar to this, only he's not Force-sensitive. So it's a little bit of a different story. It's not like he can become a Jedi and go out and fight the Sith and right the wrongs. He's just a, he's just a dude who has to figure out how to live life having been a bad dude. Uh, and if he can ever be a good dude, and he doesn't really have the means to do this on a large scale like we're, we're used to seeing. So I kind of like this ground level humanity journey that we see with Sindra as we go forward in the books. But that's not on the topic of uh, what I really wanted to get in here, which is he talks about how Akiva, which is the planet uh, that the majority of this book takes place on, uh, has always been imperial but not imperial. So Imperials have often come to this planet, especially off-duty ones. He says stormtroopers are kind of an odd sight, uh, but it's not uncommon to find people off-duty, come here for a drink, that sort of thing. So it's, it's some place that's kind of close to Imperial space, but it's far enough away where the Empire has never really devoted resources to hold the planet. And it's far enough away from the Rebellion uh, that they never really kind of took it. So it's just this planet that's kind of uh, Imperial by association. And this becomes a big deal because all of a sudden now there's stormtroopers and star destroyers at Akiva. So he's kind of the, as much as he's the former Imperial perspective, he's also one of the, you know, n not natives to Akiva because he hasn't been there his whole life, but he's been there long enough to know what's what's strange and what's not. So it's kind of interesting how he explains that. And what we find out from him is that the Empire is still highly xenophobic. And I say still uh, because the Empire is very xenophobic in Legends. In some ways, uh, this has always been kind of a, of a, how should I put it? It's always been an explanation as to why the Imperials were mostly human in the movies. Of course, the reason why the Imperials were mostly human in the movies is it's a lot cheaper to put a costume on a person than to put a costume on a person with prosthetics and they just didn't have CGI in the way we do now. Uh, so, you know, the Empire's predominantly human because budget. Uh, but Legends really explained it as the Empire just hates anything that's not human, which also makes a lot of logical sense. Uh, no, it doesn't make logical sense to hate anybody who's not human. It makes logical sense that the Empire would. Let me clarify. Now, I think it's interesting that the Empire is still xenophobic because another thing that was going on in Legends is the Empire was very sexist. There weren't a lot of female officers, and this was explained through the character of Dala. Dala is a villain in the Jedi Academy trilogy, and a, a big point is made that she's a female leader. We also have Izard from the X-Wing books, and it was always made a big deal that they were women who rose to prominence in the Empire because the Empire didn't like that. But here in Aftermath, we've already seen Sloane, and we've yet to see it be weird that Sloane was in command. I don't have a strong memory 
of anyone giving Sloan crap for being a woman in these books. Um, but I also don't have a strong memory of her not getting crap. So I'm kind of interested as we go forward to see if that sticks around as a thing. But for the most part, I think New Canon Empire is still xenophobic, but not as sexist. And I just think that's an interesting thing to change one and not the other. I, I, I don't know that I, I really have a lot to say on that. I don't know that I really think that there's a lot of meaning to that. I just think it's interesting um, to, to do that. And I'm kind of curious to kind of read for that going forward. As a total aside... Uh, this chapter has a mention of a Lothcat, which is a big deal made in Rebels. Uh, when this came out, I think Rebels was just getting started. I believe this came out around Force Friday in 2015, which would have been around September, which would have been around the same time Rebels started. Rebels might have started in October. Um, so it's kind of cool how they're like already trying to draw connections to Rebels uh, as this book goes forward. Now going back to Sinjur talking about how it's weird because the Empire has always been here but not, uh, that kind of ties into it shows the level of desperation that the Empire is on right now. That it's being chased off of so many worlds that it used to hold strongly, that it's going to worlds that it considered its own but it had never really taken the time to pay attention to before for good or for, for better or worse. And so I think that's a good way of kind of seeing where things are in the galactic state right now. Uh, moving on to the interlude on Chandrilla. Chandrilla is the home world of Mon Mothma and it's the planet that becomes the capital of the New Republic. This interlude is actually the day that the New Republic gets founded. Now in Legends, if I'm remembering correctly, the New Republic was always on Coruscant. Um, oh no, that's not true because the X-Wing books involve the taking of Coruscant. But from the Thrawn trilogy on, which is set about three years after Return of the Jedi, the seat of the New Republic is on Coruscant. And so I think it's kind of interesting that uh, this book sets it up being on this other planet, and they, they kind of have their reasons for being there. This interlude, of course, follows a, a reporter who's broadcasting it. I, I like the idea that aliens, quote, trend well, which is a phrase in here. I, I, <laughs> There's a special place in my heart due to uh, my my occupation for the jaded journalist. Um, so I, I kind of liked that, especially just hearing so much about how the Empire was xenophobic. And then you get to the New Republic, and they're using aliens because they look better on television. And I just think it kind of brings this cynicalness. Not that I enjoy cynicism, but it's just... I appreciate how right from the get-go we're kind of seeing the good and the bad of, of all sides. There is a reference in this interlude to an art uh, institute that has a display of stormtrooper, stormtrooper helmets that are painted all sorts of colors. This is a very actual, real art form in fandom that people decorate stormtrooper helmets to look like different things. There's even like a series on Star Wars Card Trader that's just different types of stormtrooper helmets, so I always thought of that. In hindsight, I think people have actually asked Chuck Wendig about this, that it, it could actually be a veiled um, reference to Sabine, that this could be something that Sabine is, is doing. And I, I think Lucasfilm has been a little cagey on confirming whether or not it's her. Um, but that might be something I look into because I think that's that's kind of interesting too. So those are my thoughts on this segment right here. Uh, this one's a little bit shorter. I just kind of wanted to deal with these two things. I'm going to go ahead and do something a little bit longer for the next chunk. I'm going to read 4, 5, and 6. 4, 5, and 6 all involve uh, the kind of similar setting, and so I think it would be good just to read them together. There is an interlude um, in between chapters 6 and 7. On, uh, but I'm not going to read that. I'm going to stop at the interlude and save the interlude for the week after. So next week, uh, we'll talk about chapters 4, 5, and 6 if you are continuing to read along with us. Please leave a comment on your thoughts on the book and some of the stuff we discussed. I absolutely want to talk to you guys. Make sure you're following us at Port Haven Forums and visit port-haven.com for even more. And we will continue this discussion on Monday. Hope you all have a good week.